This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, welcome. I, I wish I could, you know, Carl, we're losing our reputation. The last couple of shows have been going 35, 40 minutes. So yep. we got to get back to the 30 minute thing. And I'm not sure it's going to be so easy because there's so many things uh, to chat with Dr. Sorokin about. So welcome to the show, um, everybody. Uh, you know, we've got a real treat today. <clears throat> One of the leading international experts him and his former mentor, uh, Trey Rogers, uh, two of the leading voices in this particular area. We're talking soccer today, and this is an overhead view of, I think, John, was this the only permanent stadium? Um, actually, that's a good question. I'm not sure. There, there's a couple that are permanent stadiums that they've kept. There's Because most that of them one's taken down. Were made, made out of shipping crates. Yes, yeah, 974 was uh, shipping containers for sure, and that, that one's they, they're dismantling, but a lot of them, they're just reducing the capacities, the seating capacities for, but keeping them permanent. And the thing you can see in this on the right-hand side, for those of the, everybody watching on News Channel 8 here, the heat pumps. I guess there was a few of those they had to use. Uh, what was the temperatures like in Qatar at the time? You know, actually, when the World Cup was going on, it was fortunately their cool season, but it was still, you know, in the 60s and 70 degrees, 80. Uh, when it started, they were in the 80s and 90s. Oh, so it um, did cool off. Yeah, it did cool off. But it was usually in the 70s and 80s. But in the summertime, when my, the first time I went there, it was it was over 100 degrees, 110 degrees or something. So, well, now we're very excited. Our uh, three countries coming together. Uh, to host uh, 2026. And obviously, this is keeping you busy. Uh, I think I got an accurate map here of uh, the locations. And I guess uh, you're getting to go back to the homeland uh, a little yeah. bit. Well, There's that was the original one. Actually, that's a, this is an old picture. That This is the original bidding cities, all the cities that bid. Um, okay. So, so not so everybody got a game. No, not, not. And, you know, Edmonton didn't get it. Montreal pulled their bid. Um, mm. Baltimore, D.C. didn't get it. Cincinnati, Nashville, Orlando. So there's a Denver. So the one okay, down so there. Where, okay, well, we're going to get to this in a minute, but which yeah. uh, location in Canada? Toronto and Vancouver. Okay. Vancouver. Okay. So the Vancouver's been added, yeah. Okay, great. All right, so listen, let me get through the weather. Carl's got yeah. some really cool stuff to talk about. That'll be a, a nice segue into a couple of things I've got, and then we'll really get deep into this. It was a cool week last week and a cool start to next week. Um, we're going to be 10 to 12 degrees above normal when it starts to break uh, after Memorial Day. By midweek, we should be routinely uh, in the 80s around here next week, and that's really going to kickstart things. We've got some new data. If you look at our on our new runoff, page that uh, Carl's created on the forecast website. We've got this nice tracking of both air temperature and soil temperature, both, you know, what we have today and what we're expecting. And you can see that bump into the 80s coming and soil temperatures getting well into the mid 60s, finally, uh, as we get into June. So I would say we've really been cooler uh, than what you would have thought we would have been based on the way the season started. Uh, soil temperatures are still hovering now in the 50s, and uh, you got to go pretty far south to get into the mid-60s. But really, the story is dry. We have become extremely dry, particularly in the middle part of the region. Um, and this past week, it was exceptionally dry, virtually no rain. A little bit of rain came along the coast. And if you look at the last month, you can see the real strong gradient from dry to the west and wet to the east, especially along the coast. Places that have been dry in the past now are starting to get uh, fairly wet. So you got some areas along the coast that are 200% of normal uh, in the last month, but the majority of the region is starting to show pretty widespread drought stress now on, on lawns. And if you got grass on sand, you can definitely see the drought stress coming now. No rain is coming. Uh, we might get a little bit to the south and a little bit to the far north, but the high pressure conditions are going to continue to dominate the region. Now, really, one of the biggest things we worry about with sports field managers is, is weed invasion and the potential impact that could have on field safety and performance. And we are just starting to get into the crabgrass germination period. You know, down where John, where you are in Tennessee, crabgrass has already been going. And I'm sure Brosnan's got 
you know, <laughs> three, four, five tiller crabgrass uh, on oh, your yeah. way down there as well. So uh, crabgrass is just getting going for us. And something to keep in mind where you have these bare areas on your field is where you're likely to see uh, some of these plants starting to come in. So Carl, let me pass it on to you because obviously field performance and safety is going to be a big topic today uh, on the show. And I know you've got some interesting things that we've learned firsthand uh, from working with our, what would, I mean, we lost in the national semifinals this year, the Cornell men's soccer team yeah. lost in the national semifinals. Yeah, so we've become, uh, you know, sort of a, a national program now, Cornell Soccer. We've had uh, Coach Smith come in a bunch of years ago, has really sort of transformed the program. Uh, we, we've been keeping track of nationally ranked Cornell Soccer team. We're the only team to beat the eventual champ Syracuse last year. We beat them early in the year, eventually lost to them uh, in the national semifinals by a goal. But uh, this was actually the, the regional game, regional tournament game that we hosted uh, back in December. Uh, so these these the NCAA tournament happens uh, towards the end of that fall semester. And being in upstate New York, we are uh, it's it's not unusual to have a light dusting of snow at that time. So this was the morning of that regional game. We're hosting this game. We get very light dusting of snow, light enough to actually blow the the field off. So I went over the in the morning, sort of checking it out. Uh, was was kicking a ball around with the soccer uh, coaches and sort of getting there. Uh, their opinions on how the field was playing. And it was interesting to see uh, and hear from them what they were interested in. So one of the first things when they see the snow, it's cold, it's it's below 30 degrees, they're sort of looking at the bounce of the ball. So they don't want sort of a too too high of a bounce on a lot of the synthetic fields. I'm sure you you hear, John, there's these big bounces. And yeah, and uh, this is a picture I pulled from, from John's Twitter account. You guys are now sort of measuring the rebound of the of the the soccer ball uh, that's maybe different from some of the other firmness measurements uh, we the other firmness tools we have at our disposal maybe measuring different things so they cared about the bounce uh, and then they cared about sort of how the ball reacted after that first bounce so these lob through balls if if you're a fan of uh, you know the Premier League or other leagues where counter attacking teams they sort of sit in their defensive shell once they get the ball they got one or two guys who are going and they're trying to lob it over. Uh, the defense, but they want some check on that ball. So that ball doesn't release all the way to the to the goalie. Um, so the soccer coach, Cornell soccer coach is sort of kicking it around, seeing what that check is like. There's some moisture from that snow left over. Did they like it? They actually liked it. And that's sometimes uh, fields will syringe for a real quick irrigation cycle before the game to get a little bit of slip. And then it sort of checks at the end. So they were interested in that. Uh, and then very interested in the, in the ground passes, the short passing Cornell as a soccer team likes to, to move the ball around. Uh, so they're playing a lot of ground passes, short passes, trueness of role is something we talk about uh, with, with golf putting greens, right? Is it moving left to right, sort of snaking as it's moving along the ground or is it going in a straight line? Uh, another version of smoothness is, is the vertical aspect of that, the chatter. So this is really important for players. These short passes, they want that ball to be on the ground so they can handle it. That first touch it's predictable if that ball is hopping up and down, maybe you got to settle it a little bit. That takes a little time and you got to, uh, it's, it sort of slows the process of these short passing. So they were interested in that. Uh, but overall, what they were interested in, Frank, was the, the playability, the, the performance of the, of the ball, right? How that's going to affect how they play. Uh, I didn't hear anything about uh, player safety, right? And so one thing I was interested in was like, Hey, this is a this is a cold field. Are we too firm? So I took the, the Clegg out there that morning, and thankfully we were in the the ideal ranges, so it wasn't uh, excessively firm. The Clegg, sort of how we think about concussion risk or you know slip and fall injury risk, uh, versus some of the stuff you're doing, John, with you know with the ball rebound. That's maybe a playability measure. We have this ramp that we roll it down, basically a stint meter for athletic fields. That's sort of an indication of the speed of the field, how it plays. And then we've got these other things that are measure, measuring actual field safety, stuff we talk about on this show all the time. The shear vein, you know, how much, uh, you know, what's the level of give you're going to have as an athlete uh, sticking and moving. And then this cool, uh, I think you, your lab is developing something here, John, with a, a shoe that's planted on this force device that I think you're sticking into the ground. Energy attenuation, how that is going to move back into the athlete. Uh, that seems like maybe a, a, a field safety measurement. So um, it's interesting for us, you know, we talk about field safety all the time. And I think the athletes and the coaches, uh, and John, maybe this is where you come in. They're probably not so worried about the field safety. They're worried about, hey, are we going to win this game? 
how is that ball going to react that's going to uh, influence the the outcome of the game? That's that's what I noticed when I was kicking a ball around with them a little bit. Right. Yeah. Well, it's, it's definitely you hope that they don't think about the safety. Am I going to be unsafe when I'm playing on this field? They want to focus on the game and obviously winning. And uh, yeah, I, I love what you had and all those the ball you know, you, the, right there, you see the vertical ball bounce. And I, and I had to post that on Twitter because I had to show that actually Dr. Rogers and I do work sometimes physically. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we do that. We do the ball roll. But one of the other things, and I, I need to send you a video of it, I wish I would have known that. Um, we do uh, angle ball research because when you showed switching the field or putting that through ball, um, when you know when they wet, wet the pitch before a game and at halftime they want that ball to skip they don't want it to bounce up so when you're changing the field dropping it back and crossing the field that ball landing in front of the other player they don't want it bouncing higher than basically their knee so they could trap it um so this is the rebound angle you're talking about right yes. John? you don't so, want it a very vertical you want sort of right a, a so we yeah so we do a lot of research where we launch the ball in on an angle we've got like a basically a, a goalie tra trainer that, that sends it we launch it in at, and we at the certain speed i think it's 50 some kilometers an hour that we put it in we know the angle the velocity and we can video capture the angle and the velocity that comes out measure the coefficient of restitution and how many milliseconds it's in touch with the surface for and we can control that and we can say all right now for world cup you know you've got miami at sea level you've got mexico city at 9400 feet and you've got you know vancouver or seattle at sea level also but cool season grasses versus warm season grasses wow. how do you manage these pitches and then you got indoors at sofi how do you manage these pitches so that the ball is going to be the same coming off knowing that there's different species different microclimates and environment to do that so that's that's the work we're looking at is what mowing heights of the cool season grasses versus the warm season grass surface moisture so that ball is going to be consistent for if a team's playing in miami then going up to toronto to play so they're expecting regardless of the venue that the performance of those fields are going to fall in a, an expected range right they have a set of standards not for the angled stuff but they have a expect uh, for the ball bounce there's a certain percentage that the ball has to come back at and those are expectations we're taking it to another level with our testing is is doing some of the angled stuff to really fine tune that um because you know it was really easy in qatar for the most part they had the furthest distance between the stadiums was 43 miles and it's all they were all overseeded um past pal yeah so you know, rye grass, rye grass overseeded with, past palum. Yeah, overseeded with perennial rye grass, past palum overseeded with rye, perennial rye grass. So you could have eight stadiums be the same. Now we've got 16 stadiums that we can't have the same grass, but we can. So we're going to narrow it down to a, a few grasses, a couple grasses, blue rye and, a, and a, probably a Bermuda. And well, so I like, went mining through the FIFA stuff, John, and um, yeah. I'm sure you had some play in this. And again, you know, for people listening that aren't involved at the highest level of World Cup, uh, we're going to get to this, but there's going to be a lot of sites across the country that are going to host these soccer teams when they come in, right? They're going to they're going to have to, have, you know, there's going to be training grounds, there's going right. to be practice grounds, as well yeah. as these uh, 16 locations. So obviously this program that FIFA came out with and all of these publications are available uh, yeah. on the FIFA website. So again, you know, just because you're not, you know, working at these operations, you still have access to this information and some really good stuff for our average sports field managers, soccer field managers to keep uh, available where you should be testing the number of tests you do. This is performance testing. Who can do it? Do you need mm -hmm. somebody to come in or can the ground staff do it? Things like ball roll, rebound, vertical de deformation, shock absor absorption, surface evenness, all of this testing stuff should be readily available uh, to anybody that's interested in it. You know, one of the things, John, I'm so glad this has gotten a lot of play at the SFMA meetings every year, right? Because this is the kind of thing that we need everybody doing, not, not just right. the highest level. Mm -hmm. Why can't a high school field uh, be mm -hmm. held to these standards, not just for safety and performance, because we have the technology to do it. 
Oftentimes yep. what we're lacking is the expertise in the grounds people and the support of the grounds people, even if they have the expertise, they might not have the resources to do it. Now, for those that really want an inside baseball look at this, uh, this Tiger Turf Talk groundskeeper chat that you had with Trey and Jose was really good. I listened to it just the other night in anticipation of this. You know, of course, I was around there right when this was starting to happen at Michigan State. Yeah. Right when you were a student and, you know, we got the bid in Detroit and then off I went to Wisconsin and you and Steyer and, and Trey went on and, and did this great work. So if anybody wants yeah. more information about this, you certainly can listen to it here. Now, Trey's getting some mileage out of this, John. He's, yeah, you know, he is. Uh, they're building <laughs> something at MSU. You know, Trey, you know, if, if he's anything, he's a great promoter. And he yeah. really knows how to promote this. I know Michigan State has been all over this. And you guys are partnering between the University of Tennessee and Michigan, Michigan State, to support all of these operations that are going on. Now, there's a lot of right. goofy shit that's a lot of goofy stuff that's going to start happening <laughs> when you're yes. going to start growing grass inside. And then you have these turf guidelines that just got, you know, you just did a what I'm assuming this is a, a 2.0 version, these natural turf guidelines. And what was really interesting, and I think I get this question all the time, well, you know, can you, how much wear and tear can natural grass take compared to synthetic turf, right? All, right. And you have all these fully natural to these hybrid systems in a lot of different ways that I got to believe is significantly enhancing um, the wear tolerance of these surfaces. And to your point, all these, in this manual, you sort of rated the different grass types for how they do for the different characteristics, whether it's a desirable or an optimum condition. And I think it was interesting. They must be a European thing, smooth stalked meadow grass, right? That's what they call Kentucky bluegrass in Europe. Yeah. You've got these eggshell drainage systems that you're probably going to wind up using under natural grass on your synthetic fields, right? Is this what's going to be under those fields, John? Yeah, so this is a kind of a concept because one of the things we're charged with is in the dome stadiums, you know, we don't want to lose sight lines by building up a conventional, you know, 12 inch pitch over four inches of gravel because that takes out those club level seats or that front row of seats. And that, that's those are some money seats, right? So we're looking at things like this. That's, that looks like that's the permavoid there. Yeah. We're looking at is they take out the artificial turf, have the concrete or asphalt floor in the stadium, put in that thin drainage layer, maybe a shock pad that you would put between under an artificial turf. We're looking yeah, at that. Yeah, here, right? Yeah. The and then the grass on top, right. Yeah. And then so we're going to have the real grass on top that might be a hybrid carpet or a hybrid stitched system that's going to, it's only going to be two and a half, three inches of grass. So and you've been playing the, around with Trey and Jackie Guevara, right? On yep, the shot yes. head. I saw she's the a PhD paper. student. Yeah, she's yep. a PhD student working on the kind of the shallow pitch shot on plastic profile as part of her component. We got two grad students at PhD students at Michigan State. And we've got two grad students here at Tennessee, more doing the light stuff and getting ready to do the light stuff. So that's now, yeah, that's right there in Mexico City. They were all down there doing trials in Mexico City, setting up trials because you know, they have Kikuya grass in their stadium in Mexico City. Ooh. You know, that plays completely different than the blue and the Bermuda. So, but, you know, come to find out, if you look at the weather of Mexico City, it really never gets, this May is the hottest month and it's average temperature, 81. I know, because it's, it's, it's a high. what? It's 7,000 feet. No, 9,000. Nine. Over 9,000. 95. And so, and it still gets down to the 50s and low 60s at night. So perfect weather for bluegrass and ryegrass. And so we went to uh, their national training grounds for the Mexican National Soccer Federation, and they have ryegrass there. They have a four-year-old ryegrass pitch. So huh. we're looking at, you know, you can, we're going to look at growing Kentucky bluegrass and perennial ryegrass for the Mexico City game. So Ross is out there on this plastic-grown bluegrass, and he tweeted this out mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, an inch and a half thick on plastic. Now, listen, you know and I know, I think Trey grew ryegrass on plastic in the 90s i know marty petrovic did some sod on plastic here in the 80s this yeah. isn't an entirely new concept what are your thoughts about sod on plastic for the average school grounds or the municipal grounds 
as a as patches as you know you can produce it in what eight weeks yeah. six weeks yeah so, so what do you think yeah about so no this? no no idea is a no is a new idea right like you said it's been around for a long time and that's what my master's was on was sod production on plastic back in the 90s in the mid 90s so yeah. um when when I was uh, like you said, you know, I worked for John Steyer, who was Trace technician at the time, and John Steyer looked at me and another undergrad and said, "You two need to go to grad school." So myself and Brian Hargan went on to grad school. So because of John Steyer's advisement, so yeah. <laughs> so um, one of the things that came up in this uh, in this uh, planning guide, not uh, the the natural turf thing, is resource planning and procurement, and I just put this picture on because I don't even know what this mower is, but it looks like a really wide rotary, not a real mower. So give me some sense. First off, uh, I'm, I'm curious about these things. And then I want to talk about the broader project that you've got, mm -hmm. you know, where you got to do these yeah. other sites, right? There's going to be a lot more sites. What kind of mowers are these and why not just use reels? They do use real mowers. Um, prim they're primary mowers that what FIFA really likes to use are these what they call pedestrian 34 inch wide pedestrian real mowers. Um, they also have ones that are equal like that, that I think that might be that what they call the Hoover, like a vacuum yeah. That, yeah, that, yeah. that is a rotary, but that's for post match where they go and they pick up as much. They're all about the debris removal. Cause if you think about having a sand based root zone with a hybrid fiber, and then the grass over top, you can't top dress that to dilute the thatch or, or, or the organic matter that's accumulated if you re, if clippings get down or whatever. So they've got to remove as much of the debris to keep that organic matter built up. So in Europe, you know, what they do is in England, the soccer season's getting ready to end here in the next month. They'll come in in June and they'll phrase mow out all of the ryegrass off of those pitches, add a little bit more sand, get that organic matter that's accumulated at that surface and reseed. They grow perennial ryegrass as an annual crop in all these premier league stadiums. So is, are it. those stadiums, the hybrid system? So when they phrase mow, they, they, they hit these fibers. I'm yeah. assuming that reduces their lifespan. Yes. Oh yes. Yes. It, it, it can for sure. Especially when they're using the, the, the metal phrase mowers to cut them down and, that's a Desso Grassmaster system, I think, picture on the right. So there's yeah. there's different there's different ones and there's different, you know, there's Sysgrass, there's Grassmax, other companies that do the same stitching capabilities. And they use, you know, corkshoe shaped fibers, bigger bundles, so they are more rigid and stay up better. So the technology is advanced with that a lot. Um, we're doing a lot of management on that. A lot of, like with warm season grasses that have these fibers, it could actually get worse. If you if you have a Bermuda grass with a hybrid stitch system, because what it does is it makes that shearing point at that surface, it makes it a firmer surface. But if the stolons grow over it, what we find is when we traffic it, it flips up like a comb over in the wind. So it you have to manage these differently. And so we're actually brushing them like with an aggressive power brush um, weekly and just breaking all those stolons. And so you're have, trying to make Bermuda grass like a bunch type grass or only grow by rhizome. And to stand straight up right and to stand straight to, up and just to keep keep that debris out and just keep it that profile always never any thatch and just keeping it always at that same height you know i've it's, i've heard of the system i believe it's used in asia called lay and play and i'm sure you're you're familiar mm -hmm. with it um it's a natural grass system that has the fibers in it so here i have a, the image from the fifa document where you've got a fully natural which is what everybody's used to uh, synthetic elements. I'm assuming this is Beard's old work with Siffers mixing those uh, reinforcement plastic Reflex, fibers. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the, and then the, the next, netlon. and then the next one is the, oh, the netlon is the second one. The, the next one is the stitched Deso system. The yeah, natural so, institute. Yeah. So there's yeah, you, the synthetic elements. I think on the, I'm looking at the natural reinforced root zone. You could have fibers that would be like what Beard had worked with, or there's mm -hmm. just you know stabilizer solutions or something. Looks like the Easter grass or whatever. Yeah, you can just something to stabilize the sand root zone, and that's that's one thing that they look at. Then there's the stitched where they actually come in and stitch a product, and there's so there's no backing. And then there's the carpeted one, which is basically like what you'd see with our third generation artificial turfs. Um, less density and hopefully a more open backing, but it's a carpeted system that's 
filled with sand and then seeded. So, so one of the things I'm fascinated with as you're going to progress on this in the next several years, do you imagine that what you're developing here will be able to be made affordable to the average municipal school, uh, you know, sports district where a sod grower, you know, let's say, let's go to this natural synthetic carpet based stuff. You know, we know Tony Leonard is doing yeah. this primo turf, but it's, I don't think there's any synthetics in that. I think it's just thick sod that's yeah. top dressed on and they cut it and lay it and then throw it out. Can you right. imagine after you do SoFi, for example, I'm assuming it's going to be this last one, this natural synthetic carpet base that you're going to lay out. Do you imagine it can be rolled up, brought back to the farm, managed again, and then hauled somewhere else? Yeah, there's there's definitely the potential for doing stuff like that. Um, you know, the key is growing on plastic and then how, how much is it abused when it's in the stadium? Um, or where, where its application is used. And we've been doing this. Um, I've been the advisor for the National Stadium in Singapore since 2017. And that's what we've done is they, they have, we have three pitches that we grow outside on concrete and they're just, and they're zoysia grass pitches. And they're, when, when it's time to have an event, we just go take one of them, put it in the stadium and, and condition it a couple of weeks before the game, play the games, and then just cut it back out and take it to the nursery. And we can swap pitches. It's, it's, it's helped save them almost $2 million a year in their maintenance. So here's my question for you, John. <laughs> I know, I know you a long time. I'm pretty, I know you're going to pull this off. What I'm, what I'm interested in is, cause I know you also work with the NFLPA a little bit. When you pull this off in SoFi, what's going to stop the NFL from saying, well, I mean, there are, I mean, Pennington is funding all this stuff now. What's going to stop the players association from saying wait a minute you did it for fifa you did it for the world cup you can't do it for us for eight games a year. i mean we only play well and so far they got two teams right so it might be a right. little bit more um how long do you think you can keep it in there i remember back in the silver dome days when it was closed in right yeah i mean i think what did you get a month out of it before it started to fail well, what's your right. sense about the future, whether what you develop is going to be standard in places that are demanding to play on natural grass. Yeah, well, it all comes down to events for these stadiums. They're not football stadiums. They're yeah. they're event centers, right? Um, I, I think I think Nissan Stadium, where the Titans played, made they make like five or ten times more money off three days of Taylor Swift than they do the entire season of the Titans. So, <laughs> it's, well, it's, I gotta tell that's, you, that's a fact because they because. Yeah. These, these, you know, the stadium only gets a little bit of rent from the football team, whereas they get part of the tickets, the concessions and the parking from a concert or a truck and tractor pull. So, so it's, is it's, that why Vrabel was pissing and moaning about natural grass and why he wants synthetic turf in there? I don't know. They've got synthetic turf. So they said it was through the injuries, but that's contrary to all the, you know, the, what the players, so <laughs> yeah, players want the grass, the players want grass. And this is going to show that, you know, it's going to cost money, but you could have grass. And how long can you keep it in there? It depends what other events are in there that can justify it. But we're we're we've got some really cool lighting that we're doing research with, and I can I I can dim and raise the the white light or amber light, um, different lights. I can change yep. the blue and the red wavelength, and I can I can make it a short, sturdy grass. I can make it grow faster ah. and recover. And we come we're coming up, and I got a PhD student. And I'm going to try to bring on another one because there's of light recipes to light recipes. optimize yeah. these things. And, and see, we and think, see. we think, yeah, bluegrass needs 15, let's say 15 moles of light or 18 moles of light per day. Well, if you actually have 40% or 30% blue light, do you really need 18 moles? Can you get away with 12 moles? Or 14? We don't know that yet. And this is the work we're trying to do right now. It's, All right, it's listen, really we're, cool. we're, we're, we're at 1030, <laughs> but I can't let you go without some commentary because I know you have the expertise and everybody's got an opinion. Um, what was your sense of what happened at the Super Bowl? Um, what happened at the Super Bowl was uh, will not happen again. Let's will just not say happen again. the, the, uh, the, it was, and it was not, um, Andy Levy is the field, sports field manager for the Cardinals, and he didn't wasn't able to inspect the sod that went in there. Mm -hmm. He wasn't able to manage it or be a, have a voice in it. And as you know, that's wrong. You remember the Silverdome when you put grass in the Silverdome, or when you put when they put grass inside that stadium, they never ever have to water it. It no. doesn't. It's transparent. 
they overwatered that like crazy. The individual that was in charge, and that person's not there anymore. So that's probably all. That. And I but and I think what? we'll and I think we'll leave it at that. Yeah, but the last comment on that is, no one got hurt, and it probably didn't compromise the outcome of the game. And if that was the field for the Super Bowl the year before, OBJ might still be play, might not have missed the season because he would have ah. slipped instead of stuck. Because he was, it would have been on grass, not artificial. So I'm just, I can't say it, but he, his foot probably would have given. And that's right. That's might not right. have missed and the season. Y- you know what I did notice is there was a lot of people making cuts, not slipping. I think yeah. I wonder, does synthetic turf give them so much traction that they get away with not planting their feet properly, and then they take that same muscle memory onto a natural grass field that might be a little slick on the surface. They don't plant their feet right, and they slip because I saw a lot of guys jerking. Yeah. If they planted that foot right, it stuck because I'm sure your shear vein showed it was okay. Yeah, Our, yeah well, that. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I wish we could have taken our flex device that you saw, so because that can measure the displacement of the surface and how far a shoe goes through, and the forces that it takes, and the time that it takes. Because artificial turf, it doesn't, it gives you a greater force over a shorter distance in a quicker time. So it's a bigger jolt, and a lot of times you've got a different what they call gape, the angle, and that's where maybe that jolt, that force, that angle pops your joints. What a I'm treat. just a turf guy. I'm just a grass guy. What, what a <laughs> treat, right, Carl? What a treat. This I, We just get the nerd out. Uh, yeah, this, there's so many nuggets in, in here today yeah. that I have to process all of this. Too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, even, even the angle rebound stuff. I remember, I think Scott Ebden and Michelle DaCosta did that with tennis courts and different mm-hmm. grasses on tennis courts, too. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go yeah. back. Well, we got a nice so tennis much. court here in Knoxville if you want to come uh, play on it there. <laughs> Carl, we, well, we I'm no good at tennis. I'll play yeah. golf, but I'm no good at tennis. John, thank you so beer. much. Thank yeah. you so right. much. Take for care, guys. Yes, thank you. Thanks so much, John. Everybody, yeah. we'll see you next uh, Thursday for another golf. Thanks, show. Carl. See Bye-bye. you guys. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.